And we can con continue with uh, the last presentation in line uh, dealing with these ecological aspects. Um, first of all, I've got to apologize because the presentation that you have in your scripts is not the same or not the same slides as you will see here because I made some uh, changes. So this presentation is on the selection of measures and the presentation has three main sections. The first one is on some general principles and approaches which can be applied in restoration projects. The second part um, here I would like to give an overview on the restoration measures which are available. So this is the kind of toolbox that you have for a project. And third, I would like to summarize what is known about the effect of restoration on morphology and biota and how this could guide um, the selection of measures. So what is the conclusion we can draw from what we know on the effect? So but first I would like to show how this presentation is linked to the previous presentations. So in the morning, Angela started with the question, how does my stream work? So she showed uh, the, the river types, natural river types, and let's say the, the reference conditions that we can use. Second, we had presentation on the question, what is wrong? And I think here we had kind of two sub-questions. The first one is what's missing. So here you try to assess what is the difference between the present state and the state that, that you would like to reach. And the second sub-question is what is the reason? Why do we have these differences between the present sta state um, and our objective? Here you've got to identify the main limiting pressures. And as nicely shown by Nikolai, this is a rather difficult task due uh, to the fact that you have multiple pressures and interactions here. In my presentation, I will focus on this question here, which is how can we improve? Which measures do we have to select to improve our status? And I think this selection of measures can be done at two spatial administrative levels. The first one is the program of measures um, as done for the water framework directive. And here, this is a more, I would say, conceptual planning where all water bodies are included from a catchment. So it's done at the catchment scale. And as mentioned before, according to the WFD, a good chemical status is a must. And also costs must not be considered in, in this step. And this is usually done by the regional or national water agencies. Second, you've got the um, level of single individual restoration projects. So this is kind of the technical uh, implementation of this conceptual program of measures, which is often done at still done at reach scale, unfortunately. And these projects have to work in the given catchment context and, al and also uh, with the given property situation and financial constraints. And this is usually done by the local ri river managers. And in this presentation, I will focus uh, on this scale, partly because we mainly have information on this scale. So what are the general principles and approaches? And I think there is some overlap to the presentations before, so you will hear something which will remind you of the presentations before, but I think it's hardly possible to really separate all these presentations. So the first principle is that you should rather follow a holistic approach than a sectoral approach. And this means that you not only look at the ecological effects, but also at other ecosystem functions and services so that you consider all different claims to the rivers. So you have to consider possible conflicts, for example, the conflict between agriculture and potential, potentially restoring this section. But you also have to consider possible synergies. As you can see here, if you restore a river, there's also some effect on flood protection or on recreation. So it's important to consider different ecosystem services and you should have a more holistic approach. In this context, it's also very important to involve stakeholders at a very, uh, very early stage of your project. And this is because, as you can imagine, it's much easier to implement a project if it is supported by uh, local stakeholders, like especially the, the local farmers. So the second 
very important principle is that you should follow a catchment scale approach rather than a reach scale approach. And this is mainly because the pressures which act on your restored reach act at different spatial scales ranging from global climate change to catchment scale pressures like water pollution, uh, diffuse nutrient and fine sediment input, to river network scale pressures like missing source populations, missing riparian buffer strips, or um, river continuity or migration barriers, down to the reach scale and the hydromorphological alterations which are usually only addressed by restoration projects. You should address all these pressures or at least be aware of the fact that if you don't address them, they will potentially constrain the effect that your local uh, measures can have. And there's a kind of hierarchy of these pressures. So first of all, there must be water in the river and it should, be, should have a good water quality. You should not have a large input of nutrients, fine sediment, pesticides. There should be a rather natural hydrological regime and if you've ensured that this is the fact, you can go to restoring, go to the step restoring habitats in your, at the reach scale. So the next principle is that you should favor restoring processes over restoring forms. On this slide, and, and this is black and white for some reason, uh, is that in the, in the beginning we restored the forms, the channel features using heavy ma machinery. And we then recognized that these channel features are reshaped after the first floods. There are more, very more dramatical examples, for example, by Condolf et al. And then we moved a step further to this kind of passive restoration approach. And the idea here is to let the river do the work and simply just initiate the morphodynamics, so the process, restore the processes. This, of course, is um, also kind of it looks nice and is plausible. However, it's not applic applicable in all reaches. So, for example, if you've got a reservoir upstream which is changing the hydrological regime, there is not enough stream power to have these effects. It might be there is a that there is a sediment deficit, or you might have very cohesive banks. Uh, hindering this lateral channel migration, so it might be that it takes too long if you would like to have uh, in effect uh, as long as you live, as Nikolai said. So another important principle is that your measures should result in something which is biologically relevant and not only aesthetically pleasing. So here on the right you can see something which looks very nice and you might expect that diversity here is higher compared to degraded reach. But you, if you really think the habitat diversity here is not very much higher compared to a degraded reach. It's still a plain bed. There is no large wood, there are no trees, no shading, no input of uh, fine organic matter or uh, leaves. So it's, it's still from a fish or invertebrates persp perspective it's still not uh, in a good state. <coughs> On the left you can see a photo uh, that has already been shown by Christian Walter. It doesn't look very nice, but actually if this is the limiting habitat, it can be very effective. And here the idea was to have some shallow wave protected areas um, for juvenile fish. Okay, and this is connected to the last principle. This means that you should consider and identify the bottleneck and address this bottleneck rather than applying measures which are rather unspecific and just, let's say, increase habitat diversity. And this might be a good picture to bear this in mind. This is a picture of the Liebig's law of the minimum, minimum which I think is uh, a good picture to, for this idea of addressing the bottleneck. Um, another principle is that you have to apply an adaptive management approach. And this is because presently, and I think we will never reach the point um, that it's not possible to predict the effect of restoration. So it's necessary to, to monitor the effects and eventually adapt your project and um, use other measures 
or yes, adapt the project in general. Okay, so which are the restoration measures which are available? Nikolai has already pre presented some of the restoration, possible restoration measures. Um, and I would like to add some, some ideas and thoughts. S the first idea is that because you have pressures at different spatial scales, also your measures have to be implemented at different spatial scales. And this, okay, we can also think about the global scale, but I will leave this out. But I will um, talk about catchment scale, the river, river network scale, and the reach scale. So starting with the catchment scale, what are possible measures here? We can simply change the land use. Okay, there's a, there a strong lobby, lobbying group of the farmers, so this is rather difficult. But there are some studies which showed that if you've got a um, larger share of organic farming in a catchment, there's less pesticide input, lower nutrient concentrations. So this is a rather logical way, I think, um, of implementing measures. Of course, wastewater treatment is a very classical catchment scale measure and also restoring a more natural flow regime by re reducing the urban runoff is something which is, has been widely applied, for example, by um, developing such rainwater retention basins in urban areas. Okay, let's go to the next special scale, which is the river network scale. And here I would like to focus on three different pressures and associa associated measures which are the source populations, the riparian buffer strips, um, and the river continuity. It was already mentioned by Nikolai that these source populations are important for restored reach because you of course you can restore the habitats, but you also need some individuals, some species, which can colonize these new, new habitats. And based on your knowledge on are there source populations? Are there migration barriers? And what are the dispersal abilities of your species? You can assess if they can potentially um, recolonize the restored habitats. And if these source populations are not located nearby, you can also think about establishing new source populations and also stepping stones in your catchment. The next potential restoration measure is uh, to develop riparian buffer strips, like, in, like you can see here, especially in agricultural catchments. And this has been done in the past mainly to reduce the nutrient and fine sediment input. But these buffer strips also have other very important ecosystem functions like um, the shading and the effect on water temperature, but also the input of organic matter like leaves and large wood. And these buffer strips are also habitats for different organism groups and life stages. So for example, they provide cover for fish, but there are also important habitat for terrestrial life stages for the invertebrates. And in empirical studies, in many empirical studies recently published, we found that biota is highly related to the buffer land use. And the idea is if we reverse this, this potentially can be a key restoration measure. But there is some research needed how these buffer strips have to be configured, what is the necessary width, which species, tree species, should be present in these buffer strips to provide all these different ecosystem functions. So I don't think I've got to say much about river continuity and the effect on fish. But I think it's important to remind you that river continuity is also important for sediment. And here with sediment, I mean gravel sediment, but also wood as a sediment. And you have got different options to restore or to deal with such a, se such a sediment deficit. First of all, you can simply put sediment downstream of the reservoir, but you can also simply remove the dam, as you can see here which was done in, in France, I think. Um, this looks nice for an ecologist, at least. Um, but you've got also to think about the possible consequences of um, 
de delivering such, such an amount of sediment which is stored behind a reservoir to the river, which might also have some negative effects. So now we, we reach the scale of the river reach and the restoration measures which can be applied here. And this is the most widely used or addressed scale, so these measures are very often have very often been applied. And in my opinion, these measures can be further categorized along a gradient of increasing lateral extent, but also increasing restrictions due to land use. So it's much easier to implement an in-stream measure. You can also do this in an urban area, but it's difficult to restore the floodplain in Cologne. So these in-stream measures are usually applied or mainly applied to increase habitat diversity. And you have already seen several of these pictures or ideas or restoration measures. For example, placing large wood in the river or boulders increases flow diversity and substrate diversity. You can create artificial bars or riffles. Um, you can manage aquatic vegetation, for example here creating this kind of sinuous flow pattern. Or you can create very specific habitats like I've shown before. If there is more space available and more money available, you can also create and restore a more natural plane form. This is a very classical measure, remeandering or widening and rebraiding or initiating and tolerating natural channel dynamics. Okay, um, this is now, is, I think, the, the main part of the presentation which deals with the effects of these measures on morphology and especially biota and how this could guide the selection. So what are the implications of the monitoring results that we have from the past projects? In reform, we did a review and we also investigated 20 projects in detail. And this is the list of kind of key messages we came up with. And in the rest of the presentation, I would like to go through these key messages. The first key message is that, uh, again, uh, I would like to stress this, you've got to monitor and adjust your project because we cannot predict the outcome. And I would like to also to stress that the information we have is mainly on simple metrics like richness and diversity. This is because this has been invest investigated in um, past studies, but this is not necessarily the objective of your restoration project. So you are probably more interested in increasing the number of sensitive species or in restoring and increasing the number of species which naturally occur in your river type. Um, the other aspect here is that the studies reported contrasting results. So there are many studies showing no effect of restoration on different organism groups. But there are especially more recent publications, publications showing a positive effect on invertebrates, fish, macrophytes, and ground beetles. And we found similar things in our meta-analysis, so in our re review, where there is a high variability of the effect of restoration on these three organism groups. And as you can see here, about one third of the projects had no or a negative effect. And it's very difficult to say on which side of the graph you are with your project. So if you will have no effect or a positive effect. The second conclusion or key message is that restoration potentially increases the ecosystem services. There are a few studies on this, but uh, the few studies show that the total economic value can increase. As you can see here, these are four different reaches which were investigated, and the benefit is larger than the costs in these restored rivers, and these restored rivers have a 10 to 100-fold higher 
total economic value compared to the, to the, the degraded counterparts. And in reform, Jan Farmat found that similar things that in restored reaches, the total economic value is higher compared to the unrestored reaches, which was mainly due to an increase in cultural services. Okay, and this brings me to the point as that these studies, of course, depend on some assumptions. So these are studies like um, doing a questionnaire and asking people how much they would pay for this restored river. And of course, in the way you ask and in the way which people you ask, you will get very different results. So um, there is some uncertainty in these results, but I think it's still wise to select measures which potentially maximize the overall benefit, so not only looking at the ecological effects. In respect to organism groups, already other colleagues found that there is a difference between the organism groups and that especially terrestrial and semi-aquatic organism groups benefit from restoration. As you can see here, Yannick found a positive effect on floodplain vegetation ground beetles, macrophytes, and a smaller but still significant effect on fish, but no effect on invertebrates. And also in our meta-analysis, we found a higher effect on macrophyte richness and diversity compared to the effect on fish and invertebrates. So, but I would like to po point to the fact that many of the studies in literature and and also in our review, we investigated mainly widening projects. And these widening projects, as you can see here, they, they provide habitat, pioneer habitats and early successional stages in the first years. But as you can see in this picture, which is just two years after restoration, these pioneer habitats vanish over time because there is some succession occurring. And if you don't restore a natural flow regime. There is no rejuvenation of these habitats, of these habitats here. And the question is, what are the long-term effects? So as you can see here, you've got three kind of braiding channels, sections here, and again here only two. And these open gravel bars here get vegetated. In respect to the restoration measures themselves, I think we can conclude that there is no single best measure that we can offer to you. But at least the widening seems to be a very effective measure for the macrophytes. As you can see here, the effect on macrophytes' riches and diversity was higher compared in widening projects compared to invertebrates and fish. Same holds true for remainering projects and the same holds true for the effect on macrophyte abundance in remainering projects. We found similar large effects of these widening projects on ground beetle richness and diversity. And in contrast, a higher effect of in-stream measures on macroinvertebrates richness and diversity compared to planeform and riparian measures. So we concluded from this that you should select measures for your targeted organism groups and depending on which organism group you target, you should select different measures. And it's also wise to restore the natural morphodynamics to rejuvenate the habitats. We also looked at different biological metrics, so different aspects of biota, and found that the effect on abundance and biomass is, is larger compared to the effect on riches and diversity, at least for fish and invertebrates. And also other authors found similar things like a larger effect on the density of invertebrates compared to the richness in the work of Miller et al. So from this we conclude that it is generally easier to increase the abundance of the species which are there compared to estab really establishing new species. So as mentioned before, you should set realistic objectives, for example, in small mountain streams, 
naturally the fish richness, richness is low, so you can't expect a very, very high effect on richness. Or this effect on richness might be limited due to a limited recolonization potential because the source populations are missing. Okay, let's go into more detail in respect to the different habitats which you have to restore. Uh, usually many projects have the objective to simply increase habitat diversity and the assumption is that then also uh, species diversity will increase. But you should remember that specific organism groups like these ground beetles here are related to the presence of very specific habitats like sparsely vegetated bars and banks, as you can see in this plot. And also for invertebrates we found similar things. Here uh, I have to say you can uh, figure out this here, but on the x-axis you've got the um, microhabitat diversity, so the habitat diversity which is restored, and this is the invertebrate richness. In invertebrate richness increases with microhabitat diversity. However, in the projects that we investigated, the effect on microhabitat diversity was very low compared to, to the effect on mesohabitats. So, although this project restored uh, aesthetically pleasing reach, they failed to restore the microhabitats which are important for invertebrates. And this might explain why we don't see a large effect on the invertebrates, besides all the other aspects like missing source populations, lower water quality. So I think it is important to think about which measures, uh, which habitats do I have to restore and which scales are really relevant for my organism group that I'm targeting. We also looked at other project characteristics, namely size and age. And one of the hypotheses was that with increasing size of the project, also the effect on biota might increase. However, we did not find any effect of project size. And the only publication which reported a size effect investigated much larger projects. So here you can see that projects which were longer than four kilometers in length had a higher effect on the number of rheophilic species, fish species compared to smaller projects. You might say, okay, four kilometers is not very, it's not a very long project, but actually most projects are <coughs> much shorter. So shorter than 2.5 to 2.6 kilometers. But what we did found is that project age, at least in our meta-analysis, was the factor which was most important and um, yeah, having a real influence on the outcome of the restoration project, projects besides river widths and agricultural land use. So these three factors seem to be most influential on the outcome of the restoration projects. However, um, it's not the fact that the restoration effect simply increases over time. As you can see here, there was a high effect on rheophilic fish species in rather young and rather old projects and a lower ef effect on uh, medium-aged projects. And we even found a negative effect of, of time, of the age of the project. So macrophyte abundance was lower in older projects, which indicates that there is a decrease over time of the effect, uh, which might be due to the pioneer habitats and stages maturing over time and that they get less beneficial for specific groups which usually colonize these um, pioneer habitats. We also looked at uh, catchment and river characteristics and we found um, slightly higher effect of restoration in gravel bed rivers compared to sand bed rivers for fish abundance and biomass and a stronger difference for the ground beetles. You can see here the richness of ground beetles in gravel bed rivers compared to sand bed rivers. But this is highly co-correlated to other factors which potentially uh, 
have an effect on the restoration outcome. So usually gravel bed rivers are located uh, in the mountain region where widening projects have been applied and where the land use pressure is lower. So these factors are interrelated and it's very difficult to, to disentangle this and to really identify the causal relationships. So this was mainly based on these different sources. I, know, I, I would refer you to further readings to these sources. First of all, if you go to Scopus or uh, Web of Science, you will find several hundred of papers on the effect of restoration. Um, but we tried to con condense this and summarize this in our meta-analysis. You can also find um, the uh, results of the, on the 20 case studies in this deliverable but, deliverable, but also in an upcoming special issue of Hydrobiologia, and also the result of this ecosystem service study. Okay, I'm trying to summarize all this in one slide, which of course will, I will fail with this, but I will try. Um, first of all, as already mentioned by Ian, you've got to set clear, measurable and realistic objectives. Um, realistic in, in the sense that you have to consider the given catchment and river characteristics. So what about water pollution in your catchment? What about the uh, location of source populations? What about all these large scale pressures? Second, you've got to identify the main pressure or bottleneck. And as, as I said before, I think this is the most tricky part to really identify the factors uh, which cause your biota not to reach good ecological, ecological status. Then you've got to select an appropriate approach. So you should ask yourself, do I need a catchment scale approach? Do I ha have address to address these catchment scale pressures or is a reach scale approach sufficient? And you can ask yourself, is passive restoration enough or do I have to implement active restoration measures? When you select your measures, um, you've got to consider the river type. Please don't place gravel in sandpit rivers. Consider the low dynamics that you have in cohesive, um, with cohesive banks or in, in low energy rivers. Consider that potentially you have a higher effect in gravel bed rivers compared to sandbed rivers. Be aware of which target, uh, which organism group you target. Think about which specific habitats you would like to restore, which are really the bottleneck habitats for your biota and consider the possible constraints that you have identified here. So after implementing these measures, yeah, this has been mentioned several times before, please monitor, use a useful design like a full bakey design. Also con consider that there are changes over time that the restoration effects might take some time but also consider that they might vanish over time. And if you do your assessment, I think it's important to include other than the biolog biological quality elements of the water framework directive, and also to consider other than ecological aspects, especially if you would like to sell your results to stakeholders. Apply this adaptive management approach and last but not least, we are still at stage of try and error, I think. We have to try, we have to look, and I think we should be as we were at kids when we were playing at the rivers and trying to do something. Okay, that was the presentation on the selection of measures. Any questions? All are tired. <laughs> it, was, it was a long day. I have a question. Yes. It's maybe not a question, but <laughs> um, you say we are still on a trying phase. Yeah. How long do you think we can try before society will say, I don't want to give any money again to try? I think if we apply the adaptive management approach yeah. um, and really 
look after our projects, we will have a much larger effect and success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this, this will also, uh, this will be accepted by society. And there are, there are projects which work. And if I go to the first slide, whoop, to this slide, the, the mean effect is positive. So many projects work. Yeah. You just can't be sure on which side you are. <laughs> and the effects are not huge. It's difficult to, to that I think that's, that's actually difficult to say. Uh, what is it worth having 10 more invertebrate species? So and this also, I think, is linked to this ecosystem service approach. Mm -hmm. Don't only look at diversity, uh, as um, has been mentioned in the presentation before. Uh, also consider traits. What are the functional aspects? What are the functional changes that your restoration project induced? Uh, there are some studies, for example, on um, the effect, uh, as Nicola said, on, on, on leaf litter decomposition. Um, so, and I think here we are really at the start of the discussion, what are the ecosystem functions of the restoration projects which are addre addressed or improved? And I think if we come up with some um, really empirical studies on these ecosystem services, I think this could be a good argument, argument or, or a bad argument, <laughs> uh, so an argument against restoration, but I think this is something we have to do. Did it include some measures or some works on spatial prioritization for repairing buffers, as it has been done in the USA or not? No, we had no project with the repairing buffers. Um, there are several reviews on the effect of buffer strips, um, but they mainly focus on nutrient and fine sediment retention. <coughs> um, what we are actually missing um, is are more studies on the um, synergies between different projects in the catchment. So uh, is it, has restoration a higher effect if the restoration projects are located nearby? Are there synergies or is it, uh, is it not important how your restoration projects are scattered over the catchment? And I think this is also related to this repair and buffer strip question. Uh, how, how long must there be to, having to have a positive effect, for example, on water temperature? service want to restore? Do we need to put a specific lid or a specific container? <coughs> yeah. And in restoration one, you mentioned uh, see the things from the invertebrate perspective. Yeah. You are talking about an intrinsic value of the ecosystem because if you have a pleasant and beauty river, but if you show someone a river that has more diversity but not too beauty, you have a demand that is not competing with the beauty river. So how you can show it in a better way to convince some others that the ecosystems have also an intrinsic value that can influence their ecosystem, their economic value. Because the, the beauty river has a social value that the other has not. Um, yes, I, um, I think that um, the ecosystem functions or services don't go in the same don't, necess don't necessarily go in the same direction. So it can increase diversity, but have something which doesn't look very nice. That's what you mean. Uh, I think that's a fact. So if you we if we, and I think that's why we should think about kind of the in a holistic approach about what is the uh, the total effect that a restoration project has in respect to the. Um, increase of diversity on the effect on different functions and the effect on different services. And it might be that it, it is better to uh, restore something which is not very aesthetically pleasing if you give more value to biodiversity compared to uh, a project where you uh, give higher values to um, recreation, for example. Does this answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs>